All right, good morning. We start with uh, Bargawa's lecture number three. Uh, number. <laughs> Is this on? Okay, great. Okay, so lecture number three, but we're talking about n equals five. So just to remind you quickly about uh, n equals one through n equals four. There's one ring of rank one. Rings of rank two are classified by their discriminants. Rings of rank three are classified by the associated binary cubic forms. And the binary cubic form represents the most fundamental map from a cubic ring to its quadratic resolvent. Okay, then at n equals four, we saw that rings of rank four are classified by pairs of ternary quadratic forms. And those, that pair of ternary quadratic forms corresponds to the most fundamental map from the quartic ring to the cubic resolvent. So, okay, so that's how the first four cases were solved. One was sort of looking for the most fundamental map from a ring to its resolvent ring. Okay, and that heavily involved the combinatorics of these numbers. There's a natural map from three points to two points. Okay, that was a combinatorial thing. There's a natural map from four points to three points. Uh, namely, you take your four points and there are three ways to break up four points into pair, into uh, disjoint pairs. Okay. Uh, okay, so n equals 5, we want to try to look for a natural map from 5 points to some other number of points. And so the exercise last time was to try to find, uh, try to find such a map. And going from 5 points to a smaller number of points doesn't work very well. There isn't any sort of natural map. Uh, the natural map involves going from 5 points to 6 points. So so I want to begin by sort of talking about the combinatorics, uh, five and six. <laughs> this, this is something that's not quite as obvious. Okay, so how does one get six things from five things? Okay, so first there's a natural way to get 12 things from five things. Okay, so if you look at the complete graph on five vertices, you can look for five cycles in that complete graph, right, going through all five of the vertices. How many ways can you make a five cycle through five points? So the answer is that there are 12 five cycles. Oops, five cycles through five points. Right, the reason is that you can choose your first four points. You can choose the ordering of, say, one through four uh, in any way you want, and then the fifth one is determined if you want to make a cycle. So that makes four factorial different cycles, but uh, you can, if you reverse the orientation of a cycle, you want to count that as the same cycle, so you get 12 total. Okay, so think about that. There are 12, 12 ways of putting five points in a cycle. Uh, and of course, S5, right, the symmetric group on five things, acts naturally on these 12 five cycles. So these 12 cycles, you can check, form one S5 orbit. Yeah, so they're all sort of in the same S5 orbit. But, on these 12 cycles, you can also make A5 act instead of S5, right? And then it turns out that these 12 5 cycles actually break up into two, two A5 orbits. So these 12 cycles form one S5 orbit, but two A5 orbits. So I'll actually show you a picture of these uh, orbits. Two A5 orbits. Okay, so I'll show you, I'm going to show you one A5 orbit of these, of these five cycles. So in other words, they, they form two A5 orbits, they each have six elements. So maybe I'll say each containing six five cycles. Okay. I always feel bad about taking the piece of paper away. <laughs> yeah, let's wait one second. Okay, so just 
Maybe I'll put it on the side first. Uh, because we count uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that cycle is the same as 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, it's the same physical cycle. So the orientation, if you reverse the orientation, do it in the opposite order, it'll be counted as the same cycle. Okay, so you can read okay on that side. Okay, so I only want you to look at the top right now. Actually, maybe I'll hide this. <laughs> Is that visible? Let's make it a little bigger. Okay, so. Okay, so here are, uh, so that first five cycle is just one, two, three, four, five. And then what we're doing is we're going to apply the elements of A5 on that. Five cycle, and you find that you get six. Uh, you get six five cycles. Okay. And what are the other? Uh, I said there are twelve five cycles total. How do you get the other a five orbit of five cycles? What you do is you just take the graph complements of these six five cycles, and you'll get six more five cycles. And that's the other a five orbit of five cycles. Okay. So it's a to so you can see a total of twelve five cycles right here. You take these guys, and then you take their graph complements, and those are all possible five cycles that you can make uh, on five points. Okay. So they're twelve total. And they break up into two A5 orbits, and this is one of them. Okay, this is the A5 orbit containing the cycle 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So in other words, here's the map. So here's the map from five points to six points. Uh, if you have five points, then you take the complete graph in five vertices, and you look at all ways of decomposing that complete graph in five vertices into two disjoint five cycles. Right? That's your so there's six possible ways of making uh, disjoint five cycles out of a complete graph in five vertices. So, right, so number one is you have your one, two, three, four, five, and then its graph complement is the five-pointed star. Right, and that's one. And then the other pairs are given by each of the other cycles there and their graph complements. <coughs> okay, so that's your map from five points to six points. Okay, okay so this is a very classical thing. Uh, what's a little bit less classical uh, is that there's something very natural you can do here. So let's just take, suppose you take two of those five cycles. So this is one A5 orbit of five cycles. Let's take two of those five cycles. Okay. So let's take the first two. Okay. And in those first two five cycles, look at the edges that are common in those first two five cycles. So you see that two, three is common. And you see that four, five is common. Right? And those are the only two common edges of one and two, right? So two, three is common and four, five is common. So when you look at this map, I mean, when you look at this, this criterion of these two uh, five cycles, you see that two, three is common and four, five is common. The vertex one is not involved when you look at common edges. So when you, when you look at the first and the second five cycles, the number one is something special for that pair in that it's not, that vertex is not on a common, uh, common edge of those two things. Uh, so you, get, you can actually do that with any two of them. If you take any two of these five cycles in this A5 orbit, uh, there are always going to be two common edges involving four vertices, and one vertex will not be involved. Okay. That's going to happen in every case. Does everyone see that? Any questions about that? So, so you can actually make a graph on six things, namely these six five cycles. right? You can make a graph on these six five cycles, and and you you can connect each pair of these five cycles with an edge, and you can label it with that unique vertex that wasn't involved in the common edges, right? So, for example, for the first two, we saw that two, three was common, and four, five was common. One was not involved. Therefore, from one to two, we've put an edge labeled one. Right? So, for every pair of five cycles, you can label it with a unique number from one through five, namely that number that's not involved when you look at the common edges of those two five cycles. And so you get this complete graph on six vertices, and each edge on it is labeled uh, with a number between one and five. 
<coughs> Any questions about that? Does that make sense? So each edge, you can, I mean, if you just count the total number of uh, edges in a complete graph of six vertices, right? Six choose two is 15. 15 divided by five is three. So each, each number from one through five occurs three times on an edge in this, uh, in this hexagon, right? In this complete graph on six vertices. Okay. Okay, so that's the, that's the common tricks of five and six, I wanted to say. Any questions about that? So for example, one, the number one comes on just the horizontal lines here. So it comes from one and two, three and six, and four and five. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. Okay, so I'll bring that back in a second. Okay, I feel bad about taking it away, but I have to face. Okay. Right. right spot. Okay. So Okay, so that observation between five and six is what leads to what's called the Cayley, the Cayley Klein resolvent. So it's a resolvent map. So suppose R is an order. In some S5 quintic field. Uh, and say S is an order in, in a sextic resolvent field. So what is a sextic resolvent field? Well, inside, if you take a, an S5 quintic field and you take its Galois closure, you get an S5 extension. And then you take a field that's fixed by a group of order 20 uh, inside uh, S5, and that's going to fix a sextic field that's called the sextic resolving field. Okay, so if you take an order in an S5 quintic field, uh, and then you take S in order in a sextic resolving field, then there's a natural map called the Cayley Klein resolvent map. There's a natural map. So from R to S, or at least for, to S tensor Q, okay, there's a natural map from this quintic thing to the sextic thing defined by defined by f of x. And so what do you do? You use that. You want to make something that has six conjugates. Right, and that we can use, that we can do by using that common tricks of five and six. So we're going to make some we're going to take something quintic, something in a quintic ring, and we're going to make an element uh, that has six different conjugates. So as follows. Uh, so you take uh, x one. So x one x two. We're going to take a five cycle. We're going to make a five cycle. So you take x one x two. Right, remember these are the so where x1 dot 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 x5 are the conjugates. Right, are the conjugates. So you make x1 x2 plus x2 x3 plus dot 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 plus x5 x1. So we just go around in a cycle. Right, x1 x2 plus x2 x3 plus x3 x4 plus x4 x5 plus x5 x1. And then we subtract from that the graph complement. Right? So, x1, x3 minus x3, x5 minus x5, x2. Uh, 
minus x4. I just skipped one term. <laughs> okay. Next one. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, thanks. Right. Okay. And if we divide this actually by the discriminant of r, square root of the discriminant of r, actually one can do that, or maybe an easier thing. Actually, what Cayley and Klein did is um, they just squared this. Okay. So if you square it, then, then both this this cycle and this cycle are sort of now put on the same footing. Right? Square. So this thing clearly has six this thing clearly has six conjugates, right? Because this is this is this is a five cycle and this is a, this, the complement of the five cycle. So it's gonna have six orbits. Right? Okay, so this this is a natural map from a quintic thing to a sextic thing. Right? And this was a this was a very important map. This was used uh, in the classical theory. Very important map, using the classical theory of solving the quintic. <laughs> okay, so what do I mean by that? The quintic everybody says is unsolvable. So, I mean, whenever it is solvable. <laughs> so whenever a quintic is solvable, then this map allows you to actually solve it. It's kind of counterintuitive that you go up to a higher degree, but what happens when the quintic is solvable and you go up to this higher degree, you make a polynomial that has these as its roots, it turns out to factor in the cases where uh, your quintic is solvable, and you can use that factorization to actually uh, get a solution to the quintic. Okay, so this was used very, very much in the classical uh, theory. Oops. This is a great trick. I didn't know about the zoom before. Okay, so, so this was used in the classical uh, theory of solving the quintic. Uh, and it was also used in many other things. Uh, but what I want to point out is that this, so this is very, a very natural way to make uh, six things from five things. But this actually isn't the most fundamental map. This isn't the most fundamental map. So actually, the most fundamental map was, uh, it turns out, was sort of missed in the classical literature. Uh, one reason is that in solving polynomial equations, they were looking for symmetric maps. They were looking for polynomial maps. Uh, it turns out that the most fundamental map is not, uh, is not just a polynomial map. It's not a map from R to S, but it in fact turns out to be a map from R to wedge 2 of S. Uh, that's what the most fundamental map is. Uh, and I'll make that more precise in a second. So this map of Cayley and Klein uh, was useful in the solution to the quintic, uh, but this whole hexagon, uh, this whole hexagon thing that I was telling you before, uh, uh, was somehow not there in the literature. But using that hexagon uh, thing, one can actually make a map uh, of which this is a degree two covariant. This is like a higher degree covariant of the most fundamental map, uh, and that's the key map, and that's that one needs to understand uh, parameterization of quintic rings. Okay, so so let me so let me define the most fundamental map. So the most fundamental map, and this was the key in understanding uh, the parameterization of quintic rings, n equals five, which in turn depends on that hexagon. That those hex, uh, that hexagon they made. Oh, most fundamental. Uh, is a map f from the quintic ring to wedge two, wedge two of the sextic ring, or what's equivalent? If you put orientations on R and S, as we've been doing for uh, the cubic and quartic cases, um, you can think of it as a map. If you think of the dual map, it would be a map from wedge right wedge two and S and wedge three of S are naturally dual to each other if wedge S is sort of oriented. So you can think of this map as a map from wedge three of s to r dual, okay. r dual. So by this I mean the dual under the trace pairing. Huh? S is a sextic ring. That's right. 
Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, okay, so what actually happens is that it's going to be a map from right, everything's going to uh, reduce mod z. <laughs> so that's what always happens in this game. So, and then yeah, okay. So what s mod z is rank five. So, so the natural dual. Okay, so okay, so. So the most fundamental map is actually this alternating map from S mod Z, a trilinear alternating map from S mod Z to R dual. And it's defined as follows. So it's defined like this. So you take, so it's defined by so maybe I'll take it a little bit below. So you take if you take three elements of S mod Z, say X, Y, and Z, then F of X wedge Y wedge Z is given by the following formula. So there's a reason for the 16, which I won't get into. Okay, so this is just a constant factor out front, but here's the, here's the part where, where the combinatorics of five and six come up. So remember, we have to make something that has Right, we're taking something sextic now, right? And we're taking three three elements of that sextic, and we want to make something that has five conjugates, right? Because it's going to be in this uh, in this quintic uh, ring, or the dual of the quintic ring, but it's in uh, it's still lying inside, right? Our dual still lies inside our tensor Q, and, and so we have to make something here that has five conjugates, and what it turns out to be. I can just show you that hexagon again. So remember the hexagon, right? In this hexagon, right, we want to make something that has five conjugates. Well, if you take any three lines on this hexagon, right, on this complete graph, that's going to have five conjugates, right? So in particular, if we take the number one, we see that the pair one, two, three, six, four, five, if we take that set of pairs, then that's going to have five conjugates. And so we use that to just make three, uh, to make a determinant using just these, these three lines. So in other words, the pair one, two, three, six, four, five. Right? So we're going to make, so we're going to do x1 minus x2, uh, x3 minus x6, and x4 minus x5. And same with y. And y4 minus y5. And same with z. This determinant. So by construction, remember 1, 2, 3, 6, 4, 5, those were the edges that were labeled 1 on the complete graph on six vertices. And so this thing is going to have five conjugates. Right? And so this is, a map, uh, this is a map from the sextic field to the quintic field. Right? A trilinear alternating map. Right? It's alternating because it's a determinant. So it's a trilinear alternating map from the sextic field to the quintic field. And it turns out this is, this is the most fundamental map uh, between uh, between a quintic and a sextic, or between the sextic and the quintic, I should say. And I'll explain how that fundamental Cayley resolvent is actually uh, a higher degree function of this. Okay, so these are so these things here, these are the edges, edges labeled by one. In the hexagon. In that complete graph on six vertices. So I'm calling it hexagon, but it's not exactly hexagon, but you know what I mean. Okay. Okay, so I want to talk about the properties of F. So maybe I'll just fold this here. Okay, so that's our map from, right, so remember this is a map, 
Okay, I'll put it here. All right, so F is a map from words 3 of S mod Z. Power tensor Q. Okay. So I'm going to say, mention the properties of F. So, first of all, since it's mapping into R tensor Q, right, this thing has five conjugates. There's sort of five conjugate maps. So F has five conjugate maps, right, where we could have taken the edges labeled by two instead, or the edges labeled by three or four or five. We would have got five different maps, right? And they would each go to, different, to the different conjugates of R, the five different conjugates of R. Right, so F has uh, five conjugate maps. F1 up to F5. Right, F1 is just F. Okay. And here's the amazing thing. That's not at all obvious to me, but I just had to write it out. Uh, the sum of these five maps is zero. So in other words, if you take this determinant and then uh, and then you do the same map with the edges labeled by two, and then you do the same map with the edges labeled by three, uh, and so on, and you add those five maps, you get zero. Okay. Everything just cancels. Okay, so. So what that means is that um, we're landing in R tensor Q, right? F is sending you to R tensor Q, but it's landing in a special subspace of R tensor Q, namely the subspace of R tensor Q where the trace is zero, right? So you're actually landing in the subspace of R tensor Q where the trace is zero, the trace zero part. So you're landing in the trace zero part, implying F lands. Trace zero part of R tensor Q. Another way to think about this, what is the trace zero part in terms of the dual of R? Right? It lands in R mod Z. Right? So what is R mod Z dual uh, under, the, uh, under the trace pairing? Right? So the dual under the trace pairing, if you take R mod Z, remember, uh, quotients map to subspaces under the when you take dual, right? So if you think about it, what is the R mod Z dual? That's just uh, that's just right. So tensor Q uh, that's just a trace zero part of R tensor Q. If you think about that, okay, so R mod Z dual under the trace pairing is just the trace zero part of R tensor Q. Okay, so. So the point is, so it maps an R mod Z dual tensor Q, and the point is that, I mean, we haven't really defined this sextic resolvent S, but S is going to be defined. S will be defined so that image of F is not just an R mod Z dual tensor Q, but actually an R mod Z dual. Right, it's contained in R mod Z dual. Because this is all an integral theory, so we want everything, we want eventually to take away all the tensor Qs. Okay, so S is going to be defined so that F is a map from wedge 3 of S mod Z to R mod Z dual. Okay, okay and the second property, as I mentioned, is that So, well, let's just say, so this implies that F is actually map from wedge 3 of S mod Z to R mod Z dual. So, I mean, it's sort of similar to the cubic and quartic cases in that all the maps where we map, we define the maps in terms of R and S, but actually everything descends mod Z. Okay, and the same thing is happening here. We're getting a map from wedge 3 of S mod Z to R mod Z dual, right? 
or equivalently, by taking duals again, we have this map phi, we'll call it phi bar, just to be analogous to the cubic and quarter cases, we get a map phi bar from R mod Z, I'm just taking duals here, from R mod Z to wedge 2 of S mod Z. Okay, so this map phi bar is a map from R mod Z to wedge 2 of S mod Z. It's defined in terms of that determinant and then taking duals. So we have a natural map from, from the quintic ring to wedge 2 of the sextic ring, all, all well-defined mod Z. Okay, and this is the most fundamental map I'm claiming. And as Z modules, what does R mod Z look like? This looks like Z4. And what does S mod Z look like? As a Z module, it looks like Z5. Okay, so we get a map. So by taking bases, you get an element of Z4 tensor wedge to Z5. Right, so what do we mean by that? What, because this Z4 tensor wedge to Z5 is just R mod Z dual tensor wedge to S mod Z. Right, what does it mean to have a map from R mod Z to wedge to S mod Z? It's, it's equivalent to having the element of R mod Z dual tensor wedge to S mod Z. Right, and that that's, looks like Z4 tensor wedge to Z5. So this map phi bar is naturally an element of Z4 tensor wedge to Z5. And everything, again, is very analogous to the cubic and quartic case. We've now, we have this fundamental map from the quintic ring to its resolvent. And if things are to go analogously, then what we should say is that elements of Z4 tensor wedge to Z5, in other words, quadruples of alternating two forms in five variables, they should correspond to quintic rings together with a sextic resolvent. That would be the analogous, uh, that would be the analogous thing to what we had in the cubic and the quartic cases before. So I'll just so let me just so so the conjecture would be in analogous in analogy to what we did in the cubic and quarter cases is that pairs. R S, right? Where R is a quintic ring, and S is a sextic resolvent, should be in one-to-one -one correspondence with these quadruples of alternating two forms in five variables. Modulo changes of basis. So modulo changes of basis on the quintic ring and change the basis on the sex degree. Okay. So that should be sort of the analogous statement that we should get in the quintic case. Okay, so I want to talk about how, okay, so that's how one guesses the answer, kind of like how we guess the answer in the quartic case. Find the appropriate resolvent map and then try to build the definition of the rings uh, and find, uh, see where, which, in which space that map lives and then try to use the map to recover your rings. Okay, and that's what led to the theorems in the cubic and quartic cases. And, Something very analogous is happening here in the Quintic case. So one thing I should say here is that this space here, <coughs> this group action, has a unique invariant. Has a unique polynomial invariant. In other words, the invariant ring is generated by one element. The group action has a unique polynomial invariant. Uh, called the discriminant, okay. And if one takes an element, so say one takes a pair R S, and one so just take a random quintic ring and a sextic resolvent ring, so in an order in a, in the sextic resolvent field, and compute which elements you get here using that map phi bar, okay. So say your your R S gives rise to maps to A 
inside Z4 tensor Z5 using that map phi bar. And say one computes this discriminant of A. Okay, so A is an element here, it has a unique invariant called the discriminant. If one computes this discriminant of A, and one finds that it's equal to 2 to the minus 24. I mean, if you just do this calc, you, you take your R and your S, and you take your map phi, and you compute the corresponding element A, and then you compute its discriminant. And you do that computation, <laughs> you find that you get discriminant of A is 2 to the minus 24 times discriminant of S to the 12. This is a very large computation. <laughs> it took me a long time. <laughs> it took me about a month. <laughs> okay, but it, I mean, uh, I kind of expected that it'll work out nicely, that these powers will be nice, and so I sort of guessed the form of what should be true. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so eventually I was able to prove this. So you can try to put these in canonical forms, so you don't have to prove this in... This is a 40-variable space, but you don't actually have to prove it with 40 variables. You can clear out some zeros and do some simplifications. Um, okay, so, so one finds this, and in analogy with the cubic and quartic cases, we want that the discriminant of A should be the discriminant of R. I mean, that is something that we had in the cubic and quartic cases as well. Right? The discriminant of the binary cubic form was equal to the discriminant of the cubic ring, the discriminant of the pair of ternary quadratic forms is equal to the discriminant of the quartic ring. In the same way, we want, in this case, discriminant of A to equal the discriminant of R. And then, so what that then implies is that, is that the discriminant of S is equal to four times the discriminant of R cubed. Okay, so this is something that's different from the cubic and quartic cases. In the cubic and quartic cases, we said that the discriminant of the resolvent ring was the same as the discriminant uh, of the original ring. But here, the discriminant of the resolvent ring is turning out to be four times the cube of the discriminant of the quintic ring. Okay, so this is something uh, that made me stuck for a long time because I thought the discriminants always have to be the same. But in fact, I mean, after you, uh, after you work on it for a while, you find this is the natural condition that comes out. So the discriminant of the resolvent ring is always going to be four times the cube of the discriminant uh, of the quintic ring. Okay, so this is sort of the fundamental relation. Uh, and so that's, that leads us to the definition of what a sextic resolvent ring should be for a quintic ring. So if R, I'll just say it for an order again. R is an order, but one can generalize it to a general quintic ring just like we did for the, in the quartic case last time. You abstract out the properties that you need uh, for a sextic resolvent, but it's most natural in the case of an order. So R, say R is an order in an S5 quintic field. Okay, then, then a sextic resolvent S of R is a sextic ring such that so first property is that that map F applied to any elements x, y, z uh, in this ring S should actually land in our dual, in our mod z dual. So in other words, this sort of, uh, this is going to be a trace zero part of our tensor Q, uh, but we actually want it to be not in just our mod z tensor Q, but we want it to be in our mod z dual. Okay. Not in our mod z dual tensor Q, but in our mod z dual. So this, we want this to be true for all x, y, z in S. Okay, so that's our first condition on the sextic ring is that the image of F actually lands in R mod Z dual. Not in R mod Z dual tensor Q, but in R mod Z dual. Okay, that's our first uh, condition. And the second condition is, so this is just, remember this is exactly analogous to the quartic condition. Remember we wanted our cubic resolvent to contain the image of phi, right, of our fundamental map phi bar. Here, again, we want uh, the image of this map to land where it's supposed to land. And the second condition is the discriminant condition, which is that discriminant of S equals four times, oops, four times discriminant of R cubed. Okay, so that's what it means to be a sextic resolvent. Okay, analogous to the quartic case, right? We had our discriminant condition and we have our 
condition that the image of our fu most fundamental map lands where it's supposed to. So, so completely analogous. Oops. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, you have four. You have four five by five skew symmetric matrices. All right. What's two z five? You can think of as a five by five skew symmetric matrix. And so this this is the space of quadruples of five by five skew symmetric matrices. No, in the, in the quarter case, it was Z2 tensor, the symmetric square of Z3, right? Because it was ternary quadratic forms. So that's six dimensional. So it's 12 dimensional total, right? It was two copies of six dimensional things. Here is four copies of 10 dimensional things. Five by five skew symmetric matrices are 10 dimensional. Ternary quadratic forms are six dimensional. Right? So we had a pair of ternary quadratic forms before, right? There was two copies of something six dimensional. Here we have quadruples of alternating two forms and five variables. So we have four copies of something 10 dimensional. So this is 40 dimensional. In the quarter case, it was 12 dimensional. Right? Which map? It's not really degree three, it's trilinear, right? It's, it's a, so it's a, map, it's a linear map from wedge three. To, to R. Right. Yeah. Any other questions? Is that okay? Yeah. The Lagrange is on it. I don't know the real Lagrange is on it. Uh, that's possible. Okay, I, I'll have to see what the Lagrange resolvent is. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that. Does the Lagrange resolvent used for... Okay, well, actually, I shouldn't ask that now. <laughs> to sextic, right, right. Yeah. I don't think it's exactly the same, but I don't remember it exactly, so I can't say. Uh, okay. Okay, so, so this is the definition of a sextic resolvent ring. So this is actually defined on the levels of rings, okay, not just fields. Okay, and so, so now the usual question is, how can one recover? Okay, so, so once one's given a, right, so given quintic ring R, and sextic resolvent, S, we get a map uh, phi bar from R mod Z to wedge 2 of S mod Z, right? In the way we just talked about. And so, in play, you get, you get uh, an element A in this space, Z4 tensor wedge to Z5. So, so just like in the previous cases, we now want to, we want to see if given A, we can recover R and S, right? That's what we, uh, we want to know. And then we'll have a bijection between elements of the space up to equivalence and pairs R and S. So how to recover? Um, Rs from A. Okay, so what is A? Remember, A is a quadruple of five by five skew symmetric matrices. That's how you can think of the map. Okay, so how to recover Rs from A? So the thing to observe. Okay, remember we in the quarter case we just used our element A to compute the multiplication coefficients of the quartic ring. So we want to do the same thing, and we want to, we want to construct the multiplication table for the quintic ring. So where will those come from? 
where will those structure coefficients of the quintic ring come from? Well, the thing to notice is that when GL4 across GL5 acts on this space, um, GL4 is acting on the basis of the quintic ring. GL5 is acting on the basis of the sextic ring, right? Of S mod Z. So, in particular, when GL5 acts, it's only changing the basis of the sextic ring. So it's not going to change uh, the basis of the quintic ring. So, in particular, the structure coefficients of the quintic ring should be GL5 and Z invariants of the space. Okay? Because the GL5 is only acting on the sextic ring, it's not doing anything to the quintic ring. So, the fir first observation is that the structure coefficients of R should be, right, the multiplicative structure coefficients should be GL5 invariants, GL5Z invariants. of this element A in Z4, tensor wedge 2 Z5, of this quadruple of 5 by 5 skew symmetric matrices. Okay. Now we can write A as a quadruple, so we have four, right, where AI is a skew symmetric matrix, 5 by 5, 5 by 5 skew symmetric matrix. And GL5 is just acting on that skew symmetric matrix by a matrix in GL5 will multiply on the left or multiply by the transpose on the right, right? That's how we act on quadratic forms and on skew symmetric forms. Um, so what's an invariant of that action? Well, the determinant is always an invariant of the action, right? When you act on quadratic forms by multiplication by GL5Z on the left and by the transpose on the right, uh, the determinant is an invariant. So the determinant of any one of these AIs is going to be an invariant, just like in the case of quadratic forms. Unfortunately, if you have a skew symmetric odd dimensional matrix, and the determinant is zero. Okay, so that's not a very interesting invariant in the case of skew symmetric matrices, right? It's interesting in the case of, if it was, it was actually a symmetric matrix, it would be fine. So the determinant of any of these AI is an invariant, but it doesn't give a very interesting invariant. Okay, so we need to make an actual non-zero invariant. When GL5 acts uh, on these, each of these AI simultaneously, by multiplication on the left, multiplication on the transpose on the right, we want to actually have a GL5Z invariant that's non-zero. So, of course, so the determinant of AI is an invariant by this action of GL5Z, but it's zero. Okay, so that's not going to help us. But here's another, uh, here's another thing one can do, is one can take, take this 10 by 10 skew symmetric matrix. Say you take AI AJ, AJ, AK. That's a 10 by 10 skew symmetric matrix. And GL5Z is acting on this by acting here, acting here, acting by the transpose here, acting by the transpose here. <coughs> and it's 10 by 10. I want what? Oh, thanks. No, wait. Do I? No, I think that's okay. It's skew symmetric. Yeah. <laughs> so this is skew symmetric matrix. Skew symmetric 10 by 10. And since it's even dimensional, it's not going to have a zero determinant in general. Uh, it, in fact, it usually doesn't. And so one can take its determinant. Its determinant is going to be a square. Remember, the square of an even dimensional skew symmetric matrix is a square. Its square root is called a Fafian. And so take its Fafian. And that's a GL5 invariant. That's a GL5Z, sorry, invariant, and non-zero in general. Okay, so that's a, that's a natural way to make, a, uh, make an invariant. So, so way to think about, way to think about, So we can talk about, in general, right? You can take x, y, z, and r, right? And you can talk about, right? So remember, right? In r mod z, maybe. So for each element of x, y, z, and r mod z, we get a, right? We get a skew symmetric five by five, 
we get a five by five ski symmetric matrix. For every element of R mod Z, you get a five by five ski symmetric matrix. And so for any triple of elements in R mod Z, you get an invariant. Get this invariant. So this is called FAF of XYZ, which is just those, you just take those three skew symmetric matrices that you get, which I'll call A of X, A of Y, A of Y, A of Z. Okay. Okay, so this is this is how you can make a GL5 invariant. And in fact, over the integers, you can actually do a little better. You can say, I'll define these two invariants, P plus of XYZ is going to be Oh, yeah, sure. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. So, remember the map phi bar is a map from R mod Z to West 2 of S mod Z. So, if you take any element X here, it's going to map to an element of West 2 of S mod Z, which is a 5 by 5 skew symmetric matrix. So, I'm calling that A of X. So, for example, if the basis was 1, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, alpha 4, I plug in alpha 1, I'll get that first skew symmetric matrix A1. But in general, you can just take any x, y, z. So, so you can make this GL5 invariant using any three elements of R. And uh, let's see if I can remember. Yeah. Okay. So, if you you can actually make a finer invariant over the integers x, y, minus z over 2, and you can make a p minus of x, y, z as faf of x, y, z minus faf of x, y, minus z over minus 2. So you can actually sort of do this division by 2 over the integers. Okay, so the invariants actually uh, have that property. And then We have the following lemma. Okay, so these are sort of more finer invariants over the integers. These are all GL5 invariants. And then what one does, one does a, one can do this computation. So here's part A, P plus of X, Y, Z. This GL5 invariant you find is equal to the index. Okay, this is the an analog of that miraculous lemma in the quartic case. Remember where we were able to uh, recover the, the entire multiplication structure of the quartic ring. Here, we're saying that if you take P plus of X, Y, Z, Okay, where this is this GL5 invariant of the fundamental map phi bar. Uh, we find that this is equal to the index in R. This is, this is just one computation, just like in the quartic case. You just multiply it out, <laughs> and you see what happens. And you find that the index of the following lattice, 1, x, y, z, x, z, <laughs> the index of the lattice spanned by these five elements inside R is exactly that GL5 invariant. So you just compute this GL5 invariant, and you find that it's equal to this determinant on the right. Uh, and p minus is also similarly beautiful. It turns out that that's equal to index in R of the lattice band by 1, x, y, z, y squared. <laughs> so it's something very uh, symmetric and uh, very nice. And either one of these actually can be used to recover the multiplication structure on R, just like we did in the quartic case. So that allows you to construct the multiplication structure in R. So in the same way as quartic now. So these are the analogous miraculous identities in the quintic case. And in the same way as in quartic case, so I gave the details in the quartic case of how one does that. One does this, the same thing in the quintic case. Uh, we recover uh, the multiplicative structure. of R uniquely. Okay. So these are sort of the fundamental identities that allow you to recover uh, R completely. Uh, and there's an analogous argument for S. So uh, it's a little more complicated, so I won't, I won't say it out in detail, but they're analogous identities uh, for S uh, involving indices of multiplication uh, inside S, and that allows you to recover the multiplication structure on R. I mean on S, also. 
Okay, so this is our way. So there's a similar argument for R. Similar argument for S. Allows one to uniquely recover multiplication in S. And so this quadruple of alternating two forms and five variables actually totally recovers R and S. And so, and so we obtain the theorem that R, R, S pairs R, S up to isomorphism, right, where this is a quintic ring as a sextic resolvent. That these are in one-to-one -one correspondence with orbits of GL4 across GL5 on the space Z4 tensor wedge 2Z5. Quadruples of alternating two forms and five variables modulo the action of GL4 across GL5. And just like in the quartic case, uh, we only define the sextic resolvent in the case uh, where R is an order in a, in a quintic field, but just like in the quartic case, you can isolate the essential properties that you need uh, in general. For a general quintic ring, what properties you need for S to be a sextic resolvent, you just isolate those abstractly, and then that extends the theorem to general quintic rings and their sextic resolvents. So this is the an analog of the parametrization of cubic and quartic rings for quintic rings. And just like we did in the quartic case, one can now analyze uh, using invariant theory of this side to understand how many sextic resolvents you have for a given quintic ring. Uh, and in particular, one concludes, just like in the quartic case and in the cubic case, that every quintic ring has a sextic resolvent. The invariant theory is quite a bit more complicated in this case, but one finds that every quintic ring has a sextic resolvent. So there really is an integral model of a sextic resolvent field for quintic rings. And in particular, uh, rings of integers and number fields, maximal orders, so maximal orders, maximal quintic rings, have a unique, just like in the quartic case, so have a unique sextic resolvent. So, so this bijection, I mean, this, this correspondence is actually a bijection on rings of integers and number fields. Uh, uh, okay, so do you want me to stop? <laughs> okay, I'll continue in the next one then. <laughs> okay, I'll start right here.